Stanford University. Uh, my name is Charlie Yunkerman, and I'm the Dean of Continuing Studies. And it gives me great pleasure to um, say a few words of introduction to kick off the second quarter of the Mini-Med course. How many of you were here last quarter? A lot of you. How many were not? OK. Oh, yeah, that's great. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good. It's, it's almost uh, 2 thirds, 1 third. So it makes my introduction worthwhile then, because I want to say a few words about Phil Piso and a few housekeeping notices about how we're going to run the course. Uh, a few quick thank yous, first of all, to my good friend, Kathy Gillum. Um, Dr. Catherine Gillum, Senior Associate Dean in the School of Medicine, um, who is instrumental in putting together all three quarters of this course. To us, yes? Okay. <laughs> Uh, and to Azeen Masudi, who's I think probably out in the lobby, she's uh, the Continuing Studies uh, Events and Communications Manager, and she did all the logistics for the course. Now the person I'd like to spend just a few minutes introducing is Phil Pisa, who's the Dean of the Stanford School of Medicine. Do you want to clap? Yes. So, yes. <laughs> and also the Carl and Elizabeth Nauman Professor of Pediatrics and Microbiology, um, and also a professor of immunology in the School of Medicine. Before Stanford was lucky enough to get Phil to come um, to head up our School of Medicine, he was at Harvard um, and at Children's Hospital in Boston, where he was the chair of the Department of Pediatrics and, um, sorry, no, physician in chief and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Harvard. Um, he came to Stanford in 2001. Uh, he's internationally recognized for his contributions as a clinical investigator, especially in the treatment of children with cancer and HIV. Uh, before Harvard, before Stanford, before Harvard, Phil served as the head of the National Cancer Institute Infectious Disease Section, chief of the National Cancer Institute's Pediatric Department, and acting scientific director for the Cancer Inst Institute's Division of Clinical Sciences. Uh, his awards and recognitions would be too long to list, but he's received prominent awards from the US Public Health Service, including the Outstanding Service Medal in 1995. He was cited as uh, one of the best doctors in America since 1995. He's regularly cited. In 1990, he was Washingtonian of the Year. He's a member of a number of prestigious organizations, including the National Academy of Sciences. And those of you uh, who gave him that spontaneous round of applause, I'm sure were students from the first quarter and recognize how generous it is for Phil not only to have conceived of this course and invited his colleagues to come and join us here every Tuesday night, uh, throughout the year, fall, winter, spring, 30 times. Um, to be here himself, and to do his, I think, just brilliant introductions. Um, one of the things all of us, I think, marvel at about Phil is that he speaks with no notes um, at great length. <laughs> no, 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 at, a, at appropriate length, but he can, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> at at, at, at appreci appreciated length. But you also notice that he has a characteristic hand gesture. Hmm? And I have a sneaking suspicion that he's got all of his notes written on his palm. <laughs> it's kind of like a teleprompter. So watch him tonight as he gets going. If he slows down a bit and starts to do this, you'll, you'll know what's up. Please join me in welcoming back Phil Pizzo. Well, thank you all for being here. I just want to make clear and <laughs> look around. So it's great to see you uh, all here. I, it's hard for me to imagine that it's been a month since we last uh, gathered. And for uh, those who are coming back, uh, we appreciate your doing so. For those who are joining us uh, for the first time, uh, two things. One is you don't know what you've missed. Um, but we're glad to have you now because I think hopefully you'll find this uh, quarter to be as uh, exciting uh, for those of you who've been here as last. This is going to be a different tonality. We spent the first quarter really thinking about some of the big issues in science and medicine. Um, uh, we started out, as you will remember, focusing on uh, the physician in society, and we moved all the way up at the end to global health. Um, we're now going to take a drill 
into specific systems and organ problems and diseases. Uh, and this will unfold over the course of this quarter, uh, as well as the one that will follow. Um, this is uh, going to be a little bit heavy. Um, that is this quarter on the cardiovascular neurosciences side of the equation, and the next on uh, lots of other um, systems that uh, we haven't captured. We can't do everything, um, uh, but we're trying to be reasonably comprehensive. Uh, as we did last time, and we're going to experiment a little um, bit this quarter, uh, we're counting on uh, outstanding faculty to deliver great presentations. And we spent a lot of time, and certainly I did, thinking about who we wanted to speak uh, at these events. We're going to do a couple tag teams where we're going to have a basic scientist coupled with a clinical scientist, but many of the sessions are going to be given by a single individual. Uh, and ideally, uh, there'll be time as there has been in the past for dialogue and discussion, because I think that really enriches uh, the whole course of the, uh, core of the uh, uh, material in a significant way. So we're going to begin to, tonight with um, a title that I think I actually came up with. I actually named a lot of the titles before I chose the speakers. Uh, it's like putting the cover on your report before you actually have any content. Um, and uh, this one uh, I remember uh, in the winter break of 2008 calling Inside Out or something like that. Uh, and I had in mind that um, you know, at this point in history, um, we're beginning to look at the human body in very different ways than we did um, in the past. And in fact, this has huge ramifications uh, uh, for our future in terms of how we're going to teach students. One of the traditions of uh, medicine and medical school is learning human anatomy. And uh, in fact, for centuries, this has been a rite of passage, and it still is today. Um, but in point of fact, uh, we've reduced the content of human anatomy down to a much smaller distillate of what it was in the past, in part because for most physicians um, practicing now and into the future, imaging technology has become so sophisticated and so uh, good that it really mimics in many ways the configuration of the human body, even to a three-dimensional portrait. Uh, so our speaker tonight to kind of lead off this session and lead off this topic uh, is Jeff Rubin, uh, who is a leader uh, in this very area. Uh, Jeff began uh, his undergraduate work at Caltech, um, where he was a honors graduate in chemistry and biology, went on to the University of California at San Diego, and then concentrated in radiology, both at Stanford and UCSF. But we've been fortunate to have him here at Stanford since 1993, where he has risen the ranks of um, gathering skills and accolades for the work that he has done, which in passing involved creating and developing the 3D laboratory as part of the Department of uh, Radiology. He's an expert in cardiovascular imaging as well as body imaging, um, someone who's really renowned uh, around the country for both his clinical work as well as his pioneering research. Um, but like many of those who've spoken here uh, before, he's an individual of many talents. Uh, not only uh, is he a leader uh, in radiology, but we've sucked him into the dean's office where he has the role of associate dean for clinical affairs, an important associative uh, responsibility that relates to our important mission in patient care. And on top of that, he was elected uh, the vice chair of the medical staff at Stanford Hospital, and this spring will become chief of staff um, there. So someone who understands the balance balance uh, between clinical medicine uh, and research and, of course, tonight, uh, education. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Jeff Rubin to you and to welcome you all to this uh, quarter. Wow. Thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be able to be here and to begin this uh, terrific program. Having looked at the syllabus, I'm sure you'll all be delighted with what's coming up for you. And uh, imaging is a uh, huge topic for one session. And what I hope to do over the course of 
oh, 90 plus minutes, is, is to provide you with an overview of how imaging is used in the practice of clinical medicine, uh, the spectrum of imaging, the spectrum of applications, and hopefully a little bit about where we're going. But I thought I would start you off with a little warm up here. Uh, now, how many of you have heard of Steve Irwin? The crocodile hunter. Yeah, so, so I suspect that most of you know about the terrible accident that happened to him, actually a fatal accident that happened to him when he was diving a few years ago. A stingray uh, stung him in the chest. The uh, barb went right through his sternum into his heart, and his initial reaction of grabbing the barb and pulling it out resulted in his exsanguination uh, almost immediately. A, a very tragic event and one that is somehow linked to this first example of imaging that I'd like to show you as a way to warm you up uh, to uh, our session. And this is not a uh, world adventurer, uh, a man who, who risks life on a daily basis. This is a woman who is a member of a knitting club. And she was on her way out to the knitting club, a little bit in a rush, and uh, she had her bag with her yarn and her knitting needles and tripped out of her way out the door got back, reassembled herself, and realized that her chest hurt a little bit. And when she looked down, she was really surprised to see that one of her knitting needles was poking out of her chest. And so she came to see us in the emergency department where imaging played a prominent role. And this is a CT scan. And what you're looking at, and we're going to hear all about what all of this is, but this, these are cross sections uh, through the body, through the chest and the abdomen, starting up by the neck and moving down. And we're just going from top to bottom, top to bottom. And there's a number of things that one can see. This is a very rich uh, bit of information. But one thing I think you might notice right off the bat is that she has an asymmetry here in her chest wall anteriorly. And this is a prosthesis in her breast because she previously was treated for breast cancer. She had a mastectomy. And she has this prosthesis uh, as, uh, as compensation for the loss of her breast. Now, where is that funny needle? Does anyone see it here? Gosh, it's pretty hard to see, isn't it? Well, here, let's, let's look at the CT scan a little different way. It's the exact same CT scan, and we'll talk about why we look at it this way. This is the way we look at the detail in the lungs. And if we look carefully, you can see something going right in front here. In fact, let me just blow that up for you here, right here. Gosh, isn't that kind of funny? A little bit, little bit <laughs> subtle there and such. Now, you know, as uh, Dr. Pizzo mentioned to you, uh, we have some uh, new techniques, other ways to look at images like this. And so here we have uh, the exact same CT scan that we have just used a computer with graphics capability to render into a 3D model. And so this is the same CT scan. These are her breasts. And right here, you can see uh, the object of our concern, which as I blow up to you, is the knitting needle poking out. And uh, here now, you can see in a little more detail the direct extension of the knitting needle here. This is her sternum. This is it piercing it. And true to the inside out uh, that we would like to have. Here is our inside out look, standing in the chest, looking out at the sternum as we see this needle piercing the sternum. Now the question is, is what, what should she do? Did she do the right thing by not pulling it out immediately? I think probably so, because here you can see, uh, right here, the course of the needle going right into her heart. This is the right ventricle of her heart. And so this is an example of how imaging can very clearly and non-invasively map out critical information, critical information that I undoubtedly believe saved this woman's life. But there's more. <laughs> Here, here, is the, here is the CT scan I showed you originally. And as I already mentioned to you, there is a plethora of anatomy, of structure to observe and understand. Radiologists spend years uh, learning to interpret these types of data sets, have experience looking at tens of thousands of them to be able to recognize abnormalities because it's easy to get caught up in big things that you observe and important things like this. But let me draw your attention to one area uh, right here. Do you see this right here? OK. Well, this, as it turns out, is a new breast cancer. And this was uh, identified uh, at the time that the scan was interpreted. The radiologist found this. And after she had her operation to remove the knitting needle, uh, she was informed of this. And then she uh, underwent care. And this is an example of the early detection of a cancer that would have 
likely gone on quite a while before being detected. It had been previously undetected. This is the incidental identification. And because it was found here, she was able to institute treatment very uh, early in uh, the disease process and is doing well today. So with that introduction, let me take you into <laughs> the topic of imaging. So imaging, in a nutshell, is basically seeing into the living body. That is, that is what we're doing, seeing and while the body is living. And this is a very important principle. OK, what, how did we examine the body before imaging? Well, we had several choices. There was physical examination. And physical examination remains an important component of the clinical assessment of patients. But this is essentially tactile imaging, if you will. It is tactile and external. Well, Mostly external, but, but early pre-imaging, uh, gloves were not quite so well developed. Auscultation, listening. Listening was uh, developed uh, very early on. The stethoscope introduced in the very earliest part of the 19th century and became an important part of divining what the heart, what the lungs, what the gut was, was doing by not being able to look. However, Early physicians recognized the value of looking, and so exploratory laparotomy, which is basically a surgical procedure where the abdomen is cut open and under direct inspection, the organs are examined to see if disease is present. This is direct visualization, but obviously highly invasive. By way of example, it was said at the time of my medical school training that if a surgeon has anything less than 25% negative appendectomies, then they're not doing enough operations. In other words, the diagnosis of appendicitis was so challenging that the way that it was frequently diagnosed was simply by opening up and looking with the expectation that a quarter of people who had this operation would be closed without appendicitis. Today, appendicitis is uniformly diagnosed with imaging, and negative appendectomy rates are essentially unheard of. Finally, I have to recognize the microscope. The microscope is a critical, and in many respects, still the reference standard for characterizing the status of human tissue. Unfortunately, though, that tissue virtually always is excised, removed from the body, and therefore dead. And to understand what the body is, uh, is doing, how disease impacts the body, we need to examine the living system. Imagine uh, if uh, one day uh, all of us were struck by something that resulted in our paralysis temporarily, and we just fell to the ground, and extraterrestrials came to the earth and looked at us all <laughs> and said, what can I understand about human society? Well, you know, they might be able to figure something out about us by the structures that we have, the buildings, where, where we're lying, what we're wearing, some of us might be eating. But would they divine the structure of our government? Would they understand the nature of laws, our culture, society? Of course not. This is the analogy of looking at tissue removed from the living system. So imaging provides us with that opportunity to watch the culture of the human body in real time. I'm going to be moving in and out of principles that go from physics to chemistry and to medicine. And I'll try to keep it at a level that is accessible to all of you. I also want to mention that I want to give opportunity for people to ask questions. And there's going to be some convenient places to do that. So I'd like to ask that, if you can, to please hold off. And I'll let you know uh, when might be a good time to ask. The unifying feature of imaging today is, is that imaging requires energy. And there's three primary ways that energy is applied to the body in order to image it. One is transmission. In other words, energy passes through the body, and we look to see how much energy comes out the other side. This is the basis of radiography, which is the imaging using x-rays, and is the basis of computed tomography, CT scanning, which was the modality we just saw. Another way energy is used is reflection. It's transmitted into the body, and we measure the reflections coming out. And this is the basis for sonography, or ultrasound. And then finally, we have imaging through emission. Emission is the energy is coming directly from inside the body. This is the basis of magnetic resonance imaging, and it is the basis of the two techniques of nuclear medicine, 
single photon emission tomography or SPECT imaging, and positron emission tomography or PET imaging. We're going to cover all of these topics here today. This is an example of a snapshot of clinical practice in America. These are the 2009 clinical volumes at Stanford Hospital and Clinics by the Department of Radiology. My colleagues and I interpret and perform 256,000 imaging exams each year, or we did in, in 2009. And here you can see how they're distributed. Nearly 60% are radiography, what many people would call x-rays. Then CT represents 22%. MRI, 8%, sonography, 8%, and nuclear medicine is 3%. And I will, will probably give them their, their due attention based upon the prevalence with which they're used in clinical medicine. I do want to point out that one specialized type of radiography, mammography, represent about, represents about 10% of our volume. And I'll briefly talk about mammography as well. So let's start with the big one. Let's start with radiography. And I suspect that virtually everybody in this room, in fact, I'd be willing to bet that everybody in this room has had an x-ray of something at some time in their life. It might have not been by, uh, at the order of a physician, if at least by a dentist. <laughs> so radiography is projectional imaging using x-rays. How does this work? An x-ray beam is effectively shines at the subject, point a source of x-rays at the subject, the X-ray photons penetrate the body, but their intensity is reduced as they encounter tissue composed of varying electron densities. It's the interaction of the X-ray photon with the electrons that cause them to either stop or to continue through. And I'm delighted to see that we have this periodic table of the elements here. Because I just want to point out to you that basically as we move through the table, electron density increases. There's more electrons. And the body is composed of a lot of carbon. It's got a lot of hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are probably the four most prevalent elements. And you can see that they're pretty high up on the table. We're going to come back to that. Now, there's a few elements like calcium, which is in our bones, iron, which is the basis of hemoglobin. But this is really a small amount, and calcium is, is probably the highest very uh, extensively occurring element, the highest electron density extensively occurring element in our body. And we'll see how that impacts our use of x-rays and what strategies we have to augment x-rays. So what are x-rays anyway? Well, first off, they were discovered by this gentleman here. Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. So of the imaging modalities I talked about, the physical exam, the auscultation, the microscope, this is really the new kid on the block, scarcely a bit over 100 years old. And for this discovery, just six years later, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. And this is an image of the very first radiograph. It is Röntgen's wife. It is her hand. You can see the ring on her hand. It bears a scarce resemblance to the images that we see today, uh, but it is nevertheless a very historical image. X-rays are electromagnetic radiation, just like light. And here you can see uh, the spectrum of wavelength and frequency of electromagnetic radiation, with visible light representing this narrow band. And this is what constitutes our visual world, from red to blue. You'll notice that just above the visible spectrum, higher frequency is ultraviolet, and then we encounter X-rays. It is this frequency or this energy that we are imaging here. Notice that we have useful electromagnetic radiation both in lower frequencies and in higher frequencies throughout both the medical and uh, in our practical uh, world. But we're going to talk about x-rays for the moment. This is how x-rays are created inside of an x-ray tube. Uh, in a nutshell, what happens is, is that a cathode is uh, a charged structure that gives up electrons. The electrons are accelerated in an electron beam through uh, a, um, a, a field, an electrical field, that helps pull them onto a tungsten ring, which is uh, tungsten is uh, right over here, 74. Has a lot of uh, has a lot of electrons, and uh, it then the electron beam 
hits the uh, tungsten, knocks off uh, electrons, and with it comes x-rays. And x-rays are basically emitted from this tube. When we have the source here, this is where the tube is located. Here is our patient, and then there is a capture device on the other side. And we acquire what is called a static projection. We create an image of everything from the tube through the patient, the skin, the bones, lungs, heart, whatever is there. You know, even if a fly goes buzzing by in the middle, that, that should have an impact. So the x-ray beam along a line, we, we see it all in a collapsed projection, but we don't really understand the distribution of electron densities within depth. It all gets collapsed. A couple of other images of x-ray equipment. This is standard radiography here. Here is the capture side. Here is the source side. Some types of radiographs require that people lay on a table, put their extremities on a table. Sometimes they stand up, as I showed you. This is the specialized uh, machine for mammography. Uh, a woman places her breast here. Uh, compression with this plastic piece is an important element to try to um, minimize overlapping structures. And here is our x-ray source, and the detector is down here. And this is an x-ray, or a radiograph. This is a chest radiograph. And in fact, chest radiographs are by far and away the most common imaging tests performed in medical facilities throughout the world. I don't count dental facilities. Uh, dental x-rays actually are the most common use. Uh, but uh, the chest x-ray is most common in hospitals and in uh, outpatient clinics. And uh, there is a lot to be observed here, but what I want to point out to you is, is that you can see that there's darker and lighter areas that are based upon the degree to which the x-rays have passed through the body. This is a view of the front of the chest. This is a view, a lateral view of the side of the chest. When we interpret a radiograph, we are capable of distinguishing five fundamental tissue densities. They are gas, and gas because of the fact that uh, molecules are so far apart in a gaseous state that there's very little to impede the x-ray from passing through the body or through the gas area. That results in a very dark part of the image. Then there we have fat, water, mineral, which is almost always calcium in the bone, and finally, metal. Denser structures appear as white when they're denser or thicker, and I mentioned gas is black. This is a radiograph of the pelvis. And so what you'll notice here is, is that gas, which is present here within the rectum, actually, is dark because it allows the x-rays to be transmitted more readily through it. The area around the patient is black because the x-rays are passing through it. The brightest structures are the bones, and it's because of the calcium within the bones that it, the uh, x-rays are more effectively stopped from reaching the other side. Here you can see a, a view of a hip. This is the femur bone into the uh, hip joint, and these metal screws, which were placed to fix a fracture, stand out as the whitest structure, and that is because those metal screws are made of stainless steel, iron right here, and are the densest structure on the, scan, on the uh, image. So these are examples of how we differentiate. Fat versus water is a little bit of more of a subtle difference, but for example, uh, the, this is the urinary bladder here, and these relatively darker zones here are fat adjacent to the bladder in the pelvis. I just I want to briefly mention mammography and say that mammography is a specialized form of radiography. As I previously mentioned, it's used specifically to characterize uh, tissues in the breast. But be, like all radiography, it's really capable predominantly of separating just soft tissue or water density, fat, and calcium. And it's based upon those images, those uh, the characterization of those densities within the breast that uh, early detection of breast cancer is performed. Let, let's return, though, to our bread and butter here, and that is the chest x-ray. So this is an example of the kind of abnormalities, and there are many abnormalities. We could spend the whole course on chest x-rays, 10 weeks, but I, we only get about 10 minutes. So here is an example of a pneumonia. 
Pneumonia, hopefully you're all aware, is an infection in the lungs. The lungs are filled with air sacs. In fact, the chest is ideal for radiography because it has so much natural contrast. It has uh, air, it has uh, the bones in the ribs, but the air basically serves to help us to identify when something is wrong with the lungs because the air gets replaced. The air in pneumonia gets replaced by fluid and uh, bugs and uh, a lot of uh, white blood cells and other, uh, of the other elements of the body's reaction to infection. And that is what causes what we call an increased opacity or this greater degree of whiteness here. This is an example of a left lower lobe pneumonia. And I'll just give you a quick convention. We always look at x-rays as if the patient is standing in front of us and facing us forward. And so if you imagine you're all looking at me, so the left side of my body over here is over on this side, and the right side is over here. Chiropractors <laughs> always put their x-rays up backwards. <laughs> and why is that? That's because they're always working on the back. And it, that's really true. A chiropractor cannot look at a radiograph this way, just like I can't look at it the other way. Just a little bit of radiology trivia for you there. <laughs> Another important application for projection radiography is looking at the skeletal structures. And here you can see the very uh, exquisite delineation of the bones of the hand and the wrist. Compare this to the image that I showed you of Rentgen. Very, very uh, uh, clear depiction of the bones and the skin. But you know there's a lot more going on in the hands. There's muscles, there's tendons, there's cartilage, there's ligaments. That we can't see. But for the detection of fractures and such, uh, this is really a very effective way uh, to look at the body. But there's other areas of the body. Oh, excuse me a second. I think I might have just. <clears throat> other areas of body that are not quite as amenable to radiography. For example, how about the brain? The brain is a very complex structure, of course. You're going to get to hear lots about the brain throughout the course of, uh, of this course. Uh, but the brain from a radiology or a radiography standpoint is fairly homogeneous. It's almost all around water density. Now, there's subtle differences between white matter and gray matter and such, which we are able to exploit with other imaging modalities. But as far as radiography go, the problem is, is that it's just surrounded by this very dense skull. And so with radiography, we have no hope of getting any insights about the brain, whereas we get tremendous insights about the lung. Now, we could imagine maybe developing <laughs> radiography to get some better insights about the brain. And so sometimes we might imagine that this is what we're, we're, we're seeing in our, in our good friend. But, but in fact, no, we, we can't use it for that purpose. So, so not all parts of the body are useful for projectional radiography. Here is a patient who presents with this chest radiograph and pain in the chest. Now, chest pain is a very common presentation, and it has many, many causes. But one of the critical causes, in fact, the number one cause of death in the United States and throughout the developed world is heart disease. And heart disease frequently presents with chest pain. So what can we say about the heart here? Well, we see it. But the kind of chest pain that's caused uh, by heart disease typically is a blockage of the coronary artery, the artery that supplies blood to the heart muscle, and we have no hope of seeing that here. However, radiography can be used in order to see these blood vessels and many other structures by using a technique of angiography. And this is an example of angiography. Here you can see the direct injection of what we call a contrast agent into the blood vessel, which allows us to see these blood vessels. In fact, angiography is a critical technique for looking at blood vessels throughout the body. This is also a radiography technique to look at blood vessels from the diaphragm all the way to the feet in multiple images. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there is uh, an injection of a contrast agent into the aorta here. Catheter is introduced into any accessible blood vessel and advanced to the artery or vein that needs to be studied. In this particular case, the catheter went in through the femoral artery, which is located right here in the groin, and then passed up into the aorta and an injection of a radio-opaque contrast agent occurred. And we're going to talk about contrast agents in just a moment. 
In the case of the hard angiography, the catheter was a little longer and went all the way up the aorta into the aortic arch and came back around and went into the heart and engaged the coronary artery. It's important to recognize that angiography, for all its benefits, shows only the inside of the vessel. It highlights the, the, the contrast material that we inject highlights the inside of the vessel, but doesn't show what's around it very well. But uh, to give you a full sense of what uh, the quality of what we see uh, with these studies is here, here is this angiogram here. And here I just sort of move along. And you can see that from this injection, there are areas of narrowing. And there are many areas of vascular disease where we see blood flow down one leg, not down the other leg, collateral flow reconstituting, a very uh, complex and a very uh, effective way to characterize blockages in blood vessels. But this technique highlights what is a very important tool in imaging, and that is the use of contrast agents or contrast media. A lot of people call it dye. We don't like the word die when we talk to our patients because we want them to live. And so please don't call it die. In fact, even if you mean this type of die, the contrast agent doesn't die anything. It doesn't stain it. It's only there temporarily. It comes in, it goes out. It provides contrast. In radiography, the contrast agent, or in general, contrast agents are, tend to be a liquid or a gas that's delivered into the body to outline or highlight key structures. Whatever the structures are uh, that need to be highlighted will dictate the type of the contrast agent. And there are many routes of administration. We have contrast agents that are delivered orally. We have contrast agents that are delivered intravenously, which is the most common. We have intra-arterial contrast agents, as I just showed you with those angiograms. Rectal contrast, as is done for barium enemas, and uh, there's several other routes that we can get contrast in as well. The type of contrast agent depends on the imaging modality. Right now we're talking about radiography, and in radiography, electron density determines visibility, as we talked about. So we have two types of contrast agents available to us. We have positive contrast, which is a bright agent, and for that, we have to have a high electron density, and the most common Agents that are used are composed of either iodine or barium. Let's check it out here. Iodine and barium, 53 and 56 on the periodic table. Remember that bone is a paltry 20, so we've got an electron density of essentially two and a half fold greater than calcium, and then relative to the uh, standard soft tissue of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, basically a five to seven fold increase. So that's why. Uh, contrast looks so bright. We also sometimes use negative contrast uh, because we want to introduce something and make it dark, and there we want something very low density like air or carbon dioxide. This is an example of an imaging test that for many, I think, uh, thankfully, is becoming uh, a relic of the past. Uh, this is a barium enema. This is what is called a single contrast barium enema, where barium is introduced into the rectum and then flows in a liquid form and highlights the colon. This is what is called a double contrast, or air contrast barium enema, which is a combination of barium and air. And what is nice about this, you can see, is, is that the barium is used to coat the surface of the colon, and then the air fills the inner part of the tube, and so you can see subtle variations in the wall that are otherwise obscured here. So this, is bring, this brings me toward the, 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 the last comments I want to make about projectional radiography. We'll see use of contrast agents coming up uh, again with other modalities. But to summarize projectional radiography, in general, Although it, it is the most common imaging test, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's very easily performed, it's very inexpensive, and it's very low risk. It does have limitations. It's very poor at discriminating tissue densities. The body is composed of a lot more than gas, fat, water, mineral, and metal. I can assure you that. And so there's a lot we don't see with it. Also, because it's a projection, because all the information gets collapsed onto a flat plate through the three-dimensional structure of the body, it is associated with very poor spatial localization. If we're going to find disease when it's very small, it's very challenging when it is overlapping with so many other larger structures. 
So we do have an alternative to that, and uh, the alternative to projectional imaging and projection radiography is cross-sectional imaging, which is my next segue. But I thought perhaps this is an opportune time to take a moment and to ask if anyone has any questions. Yes? I was wondering whether, whether any of these will be on the internet so that we can copy the notes that you're issuing on at home. It's my understanding that the entire program will be available on iTunes. So we will be doing that. Same thing. So same thing. So um, if the instructor allows. Yeah. Assuming, uh, assuming that Jeff will allow us, and I'm sure he will, uh, <laughs> we'll be posting uh, all of the slides within a week, and then where you can go back and look at them. But what won't necessarily be available, I guess, is some of the, will some of the movements uh, be available if we do that? I bet they, that they, will. They can be. It depends on, on the process. You okay. Whatever on. you're doing. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Come, yes? light spectrum chart that you showed, I yes. think it might have had a typo on it because it looked like it went from 70 to 400 instead of 70 to 40. Did it have a typo? Well, I have to go back and look at that. I'll tell you what, catch me afterwards on that. That's quite possible, though. Eagle eyes in the audience. Yes. There's been a lot in the press lately on the recent changes in guidance on mammographies and the countervailing risk of exposure to radiography, and it's working its way into the healthcare uh, legislation reform debate. I just wonder if you had a comment. Wow, you know, there again, we could spend the entire session talking about the impact of imaging on society, and there's a lot of topics. You highlighted two very important ones. One is, is the use of mammography as a screening test and its recommendations uh, in the general population for women, and the other is uh, the risks associated with uh, radiation exposure. I'm going to touch upon radiation exposure and risks at the end briefly, um, and it's really, I think, just a little too large of a topic to entertain. I'd be happy to talk to you about it a little bit afterwards. So one suggestion, yes. um, Jeff, if you agree. So there was a, um, you may have seen it, there was an opinion piece about um, mammography in the New England Journal within the last two to three weeks. Um, what we could do is uh, put copies online if you want to look at that. It actually was quite well done and very balanced and I think gave a lot of the pros and cons, particularly about this issue of screening during the 40 to 50 period. Okay. I, I think that's an we'll excellent that. suggestion. Okay. One more question. Yes. Uh, kind of a multi-part one. Uh, so do you think that the viewing of x-rays, and maybe as we go into some of your other topics here, by doctors, is that sort of an arc? Uh, in other words, is it something uh, you know, that different doctors are a lot better than other doctors at, at looking at them? Um, second part, uh, is some of that becoming computerized? And then third part, uh, <laughs> third part, uh, Tell them to put it like this. Okay. Oh, all great questions. Uh, let's see. I'm going to deal with the uh, with the art part last, and uh, I'll, I'll start backwards. So teleradiology. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, let me repeat the question, if I can remember them all. And you'll help me if I forget. So one question but it was telemedicine, uh, and let me just relate it to teleradiology. In fact, the interpretation of imaging tests at a distance is becoming very, very common. Uh, the technology to allow for images to be distributed across uh, networks is become more and more robust. Uh, and in some respects, it's very effective in delivering high quality interpretations to relatively underserved areas. That's the good side of that. Uh, the challenge of it is, is that it can result in the dissociation of radiologists as physicians from their patients. And uh, the uh, potential commoditization of imaging interpretation by offshores interpreters and such is seen as a substantial risk to the quality of the interpretation. And so leading to your your first question, which is, is do uh, different individuals uh, interpret with different uh, quality and is uh, image interpretation an art? Um, it, it is an art and a science. Uh, there is no doubt that experience uh, factors in greatly to uh, the accuracy uh, 
of a interpreter. Uh, but I will also mention that I do believe that there are innate differences in all of us. Just as some of us are better basketball players and some of us are better violin players, some of us are probably better at identifying structures within imaging uh, tests and then uh, working through the cognitive processes of determining what they are. And uh, I think that some of that self-selection uh, occurs, in, uh, at least within the field of radiology, uh, to be able to graduate and successfully complete the board exams. You have to reach a certain bar, whether it's the NBA bar, or the NCAA bar, or the high school uh, equivalent basketball team bar. I, um, I'm not going to comment on, but it actually is a very high, high bar. And so I think that you can feel confident that if you have somebody who's completed a full training in radiology that you're going to have effective interpretation. Finally, the question was, is are computers going to help? Are computers going to take over for radiologists? And this is actually an area that has been a major focus of some of my research, developing computer algorithms to interpret images. Uh, and let me just say that it's not going to happen anytime soon, in fact, uh, perhaps at all. Uh, at least in, in the near term, it's very, very difficult for computers to see what the human eye sees and to filter out things that uh, we do automatically, and then to be able to make sense out of them. But there is a, a lot of growing technology around it, uh, using uh, computer learning based upon the knowledge of radiologists and the knowledge of physicians to inform machines, to be able to make comparisons across thousands of other data sets, and potentially facilitate interpreters of images by, by giving you information relating to how the image you're looking at compares to thousands of other images that might be in large databases. So I, I do believe that this is a very interesting direction uh, for image interpretation, but it won't be a replacement. It'll be a big help, big help. Okay, let's move on then to the topic of cross-sectional imaging. Virtually all the other modalities that I'm going to talk about today are cross-sectional imaging. And cross-sectional imaging, rather than collapsing a projection through the body, allows us to examine the third dimension, to look at the body as a three-dimensional structure, and that is typically acquired as a stack of cross-sections. That stack of cross-sections might be through the transverse plane, transverse is cutting like this, like I showed you for a CT scan. Uh, but other modalities might acquire in a coronal plane, which goes from front to back, or sagittal plane, which goes from side to side, or oblique planes, which are anything in between. Cross-sectional imaging using x-rays is called computed tomography, or CAT scanning, or CT scanning. Here you see a CT scanner. The, the basic structure here appears as a donut, and the patient lays on a table and is translated through that donut. And what comes out is basically slices <laughs> or sections of the body. Now, hopefully you all have a sense from the projectional radiographs that I showed you that there is some spatial localization possible when one gets a projection through the through the back to front or from side to side. We do get a sense if we can identify the same abnormality in these two different projections, we can probably figure it out whether it's toward the front or the back. Well, the basis of computed tomography is, is in the notion of taking projections, but many, many more projections. And those projections are acquired in a very thin section or slice. So instead of just getting two projections, we actually get many projections. Here is our x-ray tube, we have these this arc of detectors with many individual detectors, and this whole assembly rotates around the patient. And so this rotates in a physical structure called a gantry, the x-ray source and the x-ray detectors, and taking many, many projections. In fact, here is a, a picture of a CT scanner, and here is the x-ray source here are the detectors, here is the beam, and this whole thing rotates around the patient uh, in order to acquire innumerable cross-sections. And here is how it looks. This is one projection through the body. In other words, we have an x-ray source here, and it goes through, and, and these stripes effectively are the cross-section of, of structures that are allowing x-rays to pass through the body, and uh, which are black, and those that are not, which are white. But as we sum up, the multiple projections around 360 degrees of rotation, we get a sufficient amount of information to create a cross-sectional image. And so this is uh, the uh, use of many, many projections that get processed using a mathematical uh, process called a Fourier transform in order to allow us to acquire this image. 
Now, there has been substantial evolution in CT scanners. You may have heard of multi-detector CT, multi-detector row, MDCT. In this case, with a single source, uh, we have multiple rows of detectors that are acquired simultaneously, um, which has led to uh, acquisition modes like this. This is so-called helical or spiral CT, if you've heard of that, where we have interweaving helices because of the four rows. This is a four-row scanner. And in the case of helical or spiral CT, the patient is continuously translated through the gantry while the gantry rotates. And so we trace out a helical or spiral path around the patient. We still get cross sections, but there's no fundamental discontinuities here. We can reconstruct a section at any arbitrary position along this path. And here is an example in real time of a CT scan being acquired. Here's time zero. So I want you to watch. Here's the patient in here. The patient is going to be translated out, and you'll see the images coming out in real time. And so uh, here is the technologist. She's going to start the scan. And then here you can see it counting down and the images coming off. And in our current, uh, with our current technology, it literally, in this particular example, is going to take just over 10 seconds to image the abdomen and pelvis. In fact, now we can do that in uh, about a quarter of that time. This type of scan used to take minutes five minutes or so, just 10, 15 years ago. And so uh, there has just been a tremendous evolution of technology. And this has brought a lot of benefit and a lot of challenges. Let's look uh, just for a moment uh, at a comparison of what CT gives us compared to projectional radiography. Here is a chest radiograph. And in it, it's, it's a little bit uh, grainy. I apologize for that. Hopefully, you recognize the normal structures. Here's the heart. Here's the lungs. And here is an area of increased opacity in the lung, a little bit of irregularity in there. But you can tell that it's difficult to really define the specific structure in there. And here is the CT scan of this patient. And you can see that the cross-section through this area of the lung reveals much many fine structures that we don't see on the radiograph. We can see many blood vessels in here. This is the fissure of the lung that separates the lobes. And here is this complex uh, abnormality here, uh, which represents an infection in this particular patient that uh, is much better characterized from the standpoint of its uh, involvement of adjacent structures, its distribution, its association with dilated airways. So, it, CT provides us transverse sections with excellent spatial delineation and also low contrast delineation. By virtue of the fact that we eliminate overlap, we can discriminate much finer variations in density of tissue. And as it turns out, many of the organs in our body have signatures of subtly different density, different electron density, just because of their composition. The liver, for example, which has a tremendous amount of glycogen, is uh, denser than is the spleen or the kidneys. The white matter in the brain, because of the lipids in the myelin, is less dense than is the gray matter because it is more cellular. And this enables us, CT enables us to discriminate much finer gradations. Here is an example of a cross-section of an abdominal CT uh, here. And in this case, this patient has received an intravenous contrast agent. And we see the blood vessels within the liver highlighting. These are the kidneys and the spleen here. Here is the example of what CT, using the same x-rays, gets us over projectional radiography. We go from this view of the skull to being able to see into the skull, to being able to see uh, the differentiation between gray and white matter. The dark area is the fluid within the cerebral ventricles, the CSF, as well as the dark area here in the subarachnoid space. And here is an example of a patient who has just suffered from an acute stroke. In this particular case, we see this dark area here within the hemisphere of the brain, the cerebral hemisphere. And this is a key tool, CT scanning, for the early detection of stroke and management of patients. Prior to using CT scanning, prior to Godfrey Hounsfield's development in 1974 of this technology, which earned him the Nobel Prize as well, this was all we could get. And so it has been tremendously enabling. There are many important uses for CT. And in general, I, just to list a few of them, CT is at the center of cancer detection and staging. It is at the center of the assessment of patients uh, who are suffering from trauma, whether it's motor vehicle accidents, whether it's penetrating trauma from uh, gunshots, knives, uh, other projectiles, uh, uh, 
basically anyone who has an accident, uh, a serious accident, is going to get CT. Abdominal emergencies, whether it's um, bowel obstructions, uh, all kinds of infections that can occur, many complications in the abdomen, the detection of stroke and vascular imaging really has a very central role in many aspects of medicine. Another important advantage of CT is that it offers us high volumetric resolution. And when you think about it, you, if you do a CT scan in about 10 seconds, you can peel off hundreds of transverse sections. And it is incredibly inefficient to put them up in this fashion. You'll notice that I, I don't show you anything like this, but if you watch the TV shows, they still do that with the film, you know, and there's all the little squares and such. That's, that's what that is. And, and that's not, not how we look at CT scans. Now, one way we can do it is we can put them in a stack and just run through them. Now, this is really super fast, right? But the truth is, is that uh, I estimated on, on our cardiovascular imaging service uh, in a morning, uh, we will interpret up to 20,000 images, 20,000 individual cross-sections. And you can do the math about how much time you can afford to look at an individual cross-section, but it becomes impractical. You can't look at every cross-section, so we need reductionist ways, effective ways to process them to get the important information out without individually examining them. And that is where image processing is uh, at the center of the advances in CT scanning. Here is a single cross-section through the pelvis. This is a kidney in the pelvis, which is not where they usually are, and that is because this kidney has been transplanted into this patient. And if uh, our transplant surgeons ask me to tell them how are the blood vessels supplying this kidney, how are the veins draining it, uh, what is the condition of the kidney, I can look at a whole stack of cross-sections like that, or I can generate a single volume rendering like this from the data set and very quickly show them that there are two arteries here that uh, are supplying the kidney coming from the iliac artery. There is a big vein here draining into the external iliac artery. And so image processing uh, using a variety of tools has become a very important part of CT scanning. This is a standard transverse section of the knee. There is a fracture here. The tibial plateau is, is the part of the knee just below the femur, the upper portion of the tibia. And unfortunately, tibial plateau fractures are not uncommon types of fractures, very common in motor vehicle accidents. But without other image processing, this is the best that we could see. But we can reconstruct using what's called multiplanar reformation. This says MPR back here. This gives us a sagittal and a coronal view much better able to show these fragments. So we have this flexibility. We take all of these cross sections, we put them in a workstation, and then we interact with them in three dimensions. And here is a three-dimensional or a volume rendered view for, for you. Now, it's not just about creating pretty pictures. It's, this is, gets really important. Here is a section through the lungs. And there's lots of dots in there, right? Now, if I told you that lung cancer starts out as a dot, a white dot, you, you might say, wow, maybe there's lots of lung cancers in there. But if I also told you that when you slice through a blood vessel, it also looks like a dot, and blood vessels are all over the lungs and are very normal, the challenge is, is how are you going to figure out which dot is the lung cancer? And so here we're looking. I put a, a red box around one of these just to highlight it, because this is one plane. Here is another plane. And here is a, a, a volumetric view. I'm sorry it's a little uh, dark, but this shows us the long blood vessels, these other dots that connect, and this helps us to discriminate what is uh, an individual nodule in the lung. And so being able to use these tools to be able uh, to pick out and to characterize that third dimension is becoming increasingly important. There's other organs that we look at where the transverse plane that CT scanning sort of forces us into just isn't the best plane. Here is uh, the kidney, and this is where uh, called the urinary collecting system. Uh, when the kidney makes urine, it, it goes into structures that are called calyces. They're little cup structures that collect the urine, and then they come into the renal pelvis. And you, you won't necessarily appreciate this because you haven't looked at a lot of normals, but this is dilated. This is a little enlarged, and that's not good. That suggests that there's an obstruction here. But it's very hard to see in this plane if we turn it coronally and look at the axis of the kidney, it becomes much easier to recognize here and here what is called an infundibular stenosis, a narrowing of uh, this area from the calyx, which is dilated, into the renal pelvis. So these views, very, very helpful. Another example here, uh, not only of the utility, but of the, um, 
the quality of the renderings that are now available. This is a CT scan, the surface of the hand rendered for you. It is not a, a photograph. You can see that this patient has an abnormality of their nail bed. They have some large blood vessels. And using the tools uh, on our workstation, we can melt away tissue effectively here, looking at many blood vessels. And here you can see the fine detail. These are the individual bones of the hand. You're looking at blood vessels that are about a millimeter in size here in this patient who has a malformation of the artery and veins in their hand uh, that uh, we're, we're showing here an abnormal, what's called an arterial venous malformation. In fact, we can also use these techniques to slice into structures that we otherwise couldn't see inside of. This is uh, the superficial femoral artery. It's an artery that supplies blood to the foot, and it is lined with stents. These stents were placed because it was blocked, and an interventional radiologist went in and inflated the stents to open up the blood flow. These stents, just like the bone of the skull, prevent us from looking in on a projectional a technique or anywhere from uh, the outside, but we can slice along the length of the stent, making a curved plane, and we can see the tissue growth that's occurring within this stent, so-called neointimal hyperplasia. It is a complication of uh, stent deployment. Another example here, a patient with a gunshot wound, actively bleeding from the artery in their leg. And in fact, we can take multiple volume renderings and we can create video segments to show complex relationships. This is an aneurysm of the aorta. There are five arteries supplying the kidneys. One, two, three, four, five. This artery does not supply the kidney. It supplies the gut. This is what is called a horseshoe kidney, which is an unusual type of uh, kidney. But if a surgeon is going to operate, imagine the value of having a map like this prior to uh, performing the operation. And we can use these techniques to visualize from external, as you've seen, but also from internal. This is a metallic stent in the thoracic aorta, the uh, uh, aorta within the chest. It appears as though it's blocking this artery here, which is the uh, important branch, the left subclavian artery. But here, by putting our eye at this point and looking up, we actually have a perspective from within the body, looking at the origin of this vessel, and we see the complexity of the three-dimensional metal structure and the conduit for blood to flow. Perhaps one more uh, example along these lines here. Here's the standard way to look at the images in two dimensions. A very complex, uh, big structure back here. This is an aneurysm. Uh, there is a contrast because the iodine solution we've given flowing into the aneurysm sac. This is a stent graft, which is a uh, mode of treatment. It's a uh, metallic endoskeleton with uh, a graft material around it that's designed to prevent pressurization of the aneurysm sac but there's leakage of fluid around it. And, and by reformatting the data, here you see the exterior of this patient through the data sets, the exact same CT scan flying inside. We can see where the metal stent is fractured, broken in half. Here you can see a longitudinal strut that's fractured as well. And in fact, it's possible to really interrogate these data sets from whatever perspective you might like. In this case, now entering the data set and flying down the length of the aorta, here's the branches off the top of the aorta, and we're going to now fly down the length of this stent graft. And as we look down, uh, as we come down, we'll be able to recognize the fractured metallic elements. Uh, there is the uh, longitudinal strut, the longitudinal wire, which is fractured right here. And we can change our settings and look at the wall and see where the break in the outer ring is right here as well. And of course, I can show you some static pictures showing you these many fractures too. These are CT scans. This is not uh, the CT scans of 10 years ago or 15 years ago, these are the CT scans of today, and they have a tremendous uh, impact and are having tremendous impact uh, on patient care. I also, do one other application emerging for CT scanning is looking at the heart. I already mentioned to you that heart disease is the number one killer uh, of Americans in, and uh, throughout the Western world. And the diagnosis of cardiac and coronary disease is, uh, is complex. It's expensive uh, and not always effective. Up to 50% of people who uh, have a major heart attack or die of sudden death because of, uh, of a very serious heart attack uh, do so without any prior uh, symptoms. And consequently, the possibility of having a non-invasive imaging test or a non-invasive method to detect those patients is very enticing. 
It's a big step to consider uh, using a technology like this to be able to find those people. But up to now, the only way to look at these arteries has been through a very invasive method of running catheters into the heart. And using CT scans uh, to do it in this fashion, here you can see the coronaries of the heart, has generated a lot of excitement. We have a lot of science to do to really understand whether this is the effective way, whether this is finally going to replace conventional angio. But this is sort of at the cutting edge of CT technology. And in fact, we can use CT scanning also to look at time-resolved information, to look at the function of the heart muscle. Here you can see a CT scanner now that's showing us movement across the mitral valve valve, this is the left ventricle, the degree of contraction, providing us with an opportunity not only to look at the anatomy of the coronary arteries, but the function of the heart muscle, which tells us uh, whether any lesion in the coronary arteries is impacting the actual work that the heart needs to do. We can use it to look at structures like valves in the heart. This is a valve uh, replacing the aortic valve. You can see it here in two dimensions, but here is a three-dimensional look, and you can see how the cardiac valves work. This is all done with just about a 10 to 15 second scan. And here you can see just another view of the function, and one more looking down on top of it. The beauty of the CT scan, the volumetric acquisition, is you can look at the structures and anatomy from any innumerable view angle. Even newer uh, techniques are uh, with greater time resolution. Here you see blood flowing into an arterial venous malformation of the hand because of very rapid wide area detectors that image the uh, 16 centimeters of a structure with a single rotation. That allows also, for example, the imaging of the head uh, in this fashion here, and we can see the blood flowing through the arteries and then coming out through the veins in a patient who has an occlusion of, uh, of uh, the venous structures on one side of their brain. And then we can take this information and extrapolate it to create true uh, maps of physiology, not just anatomy. This is a map of brain perfusion. This tells us when we give a contrast agent, how much of that contrast agent is actually making it into the tissues of the brain, which is a very important in understanding uh, the risk and the degree of, of stroke or prior to stroke, so-called ischemia, which is a limitation of the blood supply and therefore a limitation of oxygen uh, to the tissues of the brain. And this color map shows us areas of relatively greater perfusion and lesser degrees of perfusion. It's not just the uh, heart and blood vessels. Here you can see using CT to look at breathing dynamics in the lungs here as well. So CT really has, uh, as I already alluded to, uh, uh, many very exciting uh, uses moving forward. It's also, it's very important as uh, the um, benchmark test for so many common applications and common uh, serious problems that bring people to the hospital. So with those uh, statements and views about CT scanning, before I move on to the next modality, does anybody have any questions about CT scanning? Could you just make, uh, can I just make one comment? Many of these techniques that you're showing, the three-dimensional renderings, is not what people should expect to see in their office or hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody hear, hear that comment? So, so the okay. So, so are these the standard? Do you expect to get these in all cases? And, and the answer is no. You, you, you don't get them always. Uh, I, I, it's my personal belief that uh, you should get them or your doctor should look at the scans in this fashion a lot more commonly than they do. Uh, but not everybody needs this kind of visualization. I showed you the detection of disease just by looking at the cross sections. The very first patient we saw who had the cancer detected was just by looking at the cross sections. And so there is a lot of information there. But uh, I do believe that the presentation of images as a stack of transverse sections is a little bit of a legacy to the only way we could look at CT previously. And there's going to be a, a learning period for doctors to learn how to incorporate these methods. They don't require a lot of time and a lot of work. You know, we, this is not a medical building. But if we were in the hospital, you might find some uh, fluorescent light boxes on the wall, so-called view boxes. And that's how we looked at images. We put x-rays up on film. This type of technology here is the view box of the future. These are interactive displays, and one can very intuitively navigate through the data. But it is a gradual transition, and this truly is at the uh, cutting edge uh, of assessment. Yes? 
potential, but sometime in the future, just as we go to a dentist every six months to get our teeth checked out, when we go every six months or an interval to get the heart checked out uh, as, as an entire population. So the question is, is, you know, just like we go and have screening dental films, are we likely to be screening our heart and doing screening imaging throughout? That is a very uh, complicated topic, and it's a very important one because, um, as we'll talk about at the end, imaging is not without risk, and it's certainly not without cost. And we have to understand when and how to effectively use imaging and efficiently use imaging within the means of our healthcare system and to maximally benefit people. There is the possibility, it's a very real phenomenon with imaging, that false positive, in other words, findings are identified that appear to be abnormal that aren't abnormal. And it doesn't take long to look through the internet to find cases of people who will say, I went in for this routine something or other, and my doctor found that, and I ended up with three operations, and I'm really debilitated, and in the end it was nothing. Unfortunately, that's, that's not so uncommon of a story. So we have to be really responsible about how imaging is used. We have to be good stewards of this technology in the medical profession. And I, so I do not believe for many uh, problems that we will just be screening everybody. However, with greater characterization of the profile of people, looking at high-risk people, either by looking at certain molecular markers within them uh, in combination with uh, their social environment, their family history, their disease history and such, we may be able to find pockets of the population where imaging screening makes sense. Other questions, yes? Yeah, CT has just um, advanced so amazingly in the past decade or so. Do you see it advancing at this rate uh, in the future? And what do you see as the, the next innovation and how big will the innovation be and what area will be radiation reduction or new areas of the body? Or yeah, that's a very, very good and insightful question. So, so yeah, CT has advanced very, very quickly. Where is it going? Uh, and the question about radiation reduction actually is a great question because uh, there are new technologies that have just been advanced that promise to reduce the radiation exposure from a CT probably by about a factor of 8 to 10, which is a major uh, issue, obviously, with CT scanning. Uh, but that's not the only uh, advantage. We're seeing uh, development of techniques to allow better characterization of tissue types with CT over and above the principles that I've shown you. And uh, it, it's a little beyond the scope of, I think, where we want to go to talk about all of the possible future developments. But one thing's for sure is, is that the acceleration, the pace of acceleration of all these modalities particularly CT and MRI scanning, is only increasing. And uh, what we see now uh, will seem old hat in five years, and we can only dream what will be coming in the future. Yes? Uh, how many hospitals have uh, the ability to take CT? You can download software on the internet for free and do this. So if you have the CT data, you can do it, and so can any hospital. It's a matter of... Uh, uh, you know, of how, how, uh, you know, how much you want to, uh, to focus on doing it. Now, images like this, this is not just uh, the computer processing. This is having a special CT scanner. And in fact, the CT scanner that acquired this, there's probably only about 70 of them in the world right now. They're new. I'm sure that the company that makes the CT scanner is hoping that they're going to sell a lot of them. Uh, but this is definitely at the, the cutting edge of technology. And what you see with CT technology is CT scanners are expensive. And so hospitals need to keep CT scanners for a while until they've served their useful life. So it takes time for new technology to fully permeate uh, health practice. Yes, in the back. I'm just curious uh, how long it takes you as a radiologist to set up uh an image like that uh, heart valve in operation? Well, if I told you that I can do it in 30 seconds, you know, would you believe me? It's true. But I've been doing it uh, for many, many years, and I'm very familiar with the software tools that I use. The way I explain it to other doctors is it's like driving a car. Using a workstation, ha the workstation has to become an extension of your body. When you get behind the wheel of a car, you don't think, I need to put my hands on the wheel, I need to grab the gear shift, I need to put my foot. It all comes naturally. It's a natural extension of what you're trying to do. And that is what visualization here, it, it's very similar to that. It just becomes uh, sort of natural. And if you're familiar with the tools, you can do it very, very quickly. 
Uh, let's see, maybe two more questions uh, right here. Could you use these uh, three images to create a stereoscopic view for the surgeon so that they could actually do virtual surgery for doing the real surgery? You can. So, so there's, yeah, the question is, can you use these images to create a stereoscopic view for the surgeon so they can use these images to guide their surgery? You can use these images to create stereoscopic images. It's been shown over many years. You know, it requires that everybody have the special glasses uh, to look at them that way. But it is very compelling to do it. There's also uh, some very um, advanced labs, a few labs around the world, where they're taking the imaging data and they're projecting it onto the patient in the operating room as a means to directly you know, see and guide. And in fact, there's even technology, for example, in the brain, which is a relatively static structure, to try to, in real time, as the surgeon is operating, detect changes in the position of the tissue and then distort the preoperative imaging to maintain a map onto it. So there's a lot of work in this area, but this truly is very cutting edge uh, research that we're referring to. Let's see. Um, let me get someone back up here. Um, I'm wondering if you if there's a difference in the resolution in an image like this as opposed to the way that, that people describe resolution in some of the projection images. Does it does it look so much clearer because there's more information, or can you actually resolve the finer detail? And how is that different among these different? So, um, so when we talk about resolution, there's three broad types of resolution we talk about. There's spatial resolution. There's low contrast resolution, and there's temporal resolution, which is our ability to see things across time. Low contrast is to resolve structures that are of similar density. I think you're talking about the spatial resolution, which is to see fine uh, spatial elements. Um, just as when you take a digital photograph, you have an opportunity to optimize the way the image is presented to accentuate certain structures. Uh, you, if you use Photoshop at all, you can uh, highlight and bring out detail in the image that conveys information that you want. We can do the same here. So what appears to be crisper and sharper may in part relate to how the image is being created. We don't add resolution through these techniques. But I will tell you this, is, is that a CT scan as a volumetric imaging tool is composed of lots of little cubes of information, what we call voxels. And the dimension of a voxel from a high resolution CT scan is about 500 by 500 by 500 microns, which is a half of a millimeter, which is really thin. So the spatial resolution of CT scanners are very high. They don't approach microscopy. I mean, there, there's they are currently our highest spatial resolution modality, uh, but um, I think as we will see moving forward here, they're not the cat's meow all the time. They, we don't just use CT for everything. There are other, there are some things that CT isn't particularly good at, and let's let's learn about some of those things. Okay, all right. So let's move on. I want to turn to sonography. And you know, it might seem a little bit out of order. At, at some point, I was thinking, you know, I should really talk about sonography second, because it was developed before CT. In fact, sonography came out of technology developed in World War II to help uh, our submarine fleets and, and sonar uh, localization of the seafloor and such. It's the same principle, where the submarines would send sound uh, down uh, and uh, measure the time it would take for the sound to come back in order to uh, look at the topography of the seafloor underneath it. We, we use a similar principle to image the body. And uh, sonography is, is very, very valuable. So uh, sonography, also called ultrasound, and uh, by ultrasound, it's a high frequency sound above our audible hearing. So usually the, the audible range for us is anywhere from about 20 hertz up to about 20,000 hertz. And this is going to be above that. We'll talk about exactly how high in just a moment. The frequency comes from what's called a transducer. It's a physical structure that's applied to the body, as I'll show you in a moment. And then we apply an acoustic gel. Uh, any of you who have had a sonogram before know about the warm gel that gets put on there, which couples the sound generated from the transducer to the body so it effectively transmits through the body. Uh, and uh, aids in, in, in the sound transmission. The sound then goes through the body but is reflected at tissue interfaces. Wherever there is a change 
in the nature of the tissue that results in a change in the speed of sound causes the sound to bounce back. And so the transducer serves two purposes. It sends sound, but then after it sends a pulse, it waits and it listens. And it listens for how much sound is coming back, what is the frequency of the sound coming back, and how delayed the sound is coming back. In general, structures like fluid have no interfaces, and thus sound moves through them very effectively, and they look black. Gas and bone are very poor transmitters of sound. Sound travels best through a fluid, and they block sound from reaching deeper tissues. And we'll look at some examples in a moment. Here is an example of a woman undergoing a sonogram. This is a pregnant woman, and as we'll see, obstetrics is a very important application for sonography. Here you can see a uh, typical ultrasound console. These are the transducers uh, that are attached to it, and here uh, the sonographer is holding the transducer uh, to the patient's body. This is a schematic of uh, how the transducer works. It sends a pulse, and then that pulse propagates through the body. It reaches a tissue interface, and then it returns back. The frequency with which this occurs is between 1 and 10 megahertz. We talked about audible sound as being from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And uh, so this is much higher, up to a million to 10 million uh, cycles per second. And when we look at tissue, and this is an image of the liver, what happens is, is that there's many little reflectors in here, tissue interfaces. Here's just a schematic. The beam comes through, and whenever it hits uh, a little tissue interface, it, it sends back an echo, and it allows us to see what looks like a speckly pattern. And here is an image of an ultrasound image uh, looking at a patient's liver. Now, the transducer is applied right here on the abdomen. And so we get this window, the so-called acoustic window, which looks through and allows us to see this portion of the liver. This is the big blood vessel that returns blood back to the heart, the inferior vena cava. And these are what are called the hepatic veins, which are the veins draining the blood from the liver. This bright line here is the diaphragm, the muscle of breathing that separates the abdomen from the chest. Uh, and above that is air in the lung. And as I mentioned to you, Air does not transmit sound, so we see no detail up here, whereas we see some fine detail within the liver. Here is an example of the kidney as viewed through a sonogram. This particular view holds the transducer along the long axis of the kidney coming in from the flank, and we have a nice acoustic window through the liver. The liver is fairly homogeneous and transmits the sound well, and so we can see the outline of the kidney here. Inside, we see higher echoes. It's wider, and that's because the, what's called the sinus, or the central portion of the kidney, is filled with fat. And that tends to reflect sound a little bit better. So this is an example of imaging the kidney with ultrasound. Now, here's a comparison of sonography versus CT in the same patient. Notice that the CT scan shows us the liver. In this case, the inferior vena cava and hepatic veins are bright because we've injected the patient with iodine. And here, they are dark because sound passes through uh, homogeneous fluid structures like blood in the flowing blood in these vessels. But you'll notice that while we can see structure in the lung, at least a couple of blood vessels here, and in fact, see the chest wall through it, on the sonogram, we see nothing through the diaphragm. So blood vessels are dark, air in the lungs blocks the sound. CT gives us a complete overview. We see everything. Sonography is highly dependent on the quality of our acoustic window. We need to transmit through structures that do not block the sound. We cannot transmit through bone. We cannot transmit through a rib. We can transmit between ribs. We cannot transmit through the lung. So sonography is very limited by being only able to examine tissues that provide a path from surface to that tissue that favors the passage of sound and the return of sound. One very important area for the use of sonography is the assessment of the heart. And uh, echocardiography, as uh, ultrasound or sonography of the heart is called, is a very important test that provides many um, uh, important character characterizations of heart function. In this case, we're looking at what's called a four-chamber view of the heart. This is the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium. We see the movement of the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. And this provides, this is probably the most commonly used tool 
in the United States and probably throughout the developed world for characterizing the effectiveness with which these muscles contract and with which these valves function. Very, very important and common method of assessing the heart. The other very important application is, is obstetrical applications. And this is an example of obstetrical sonography. This is, uh, is a pregnant uterus, and this is a small fluid sac, and within it is a uh, embryo that is roughly five weeks old. This is just about six millimeters long, and we see a little motion, and right here you see the flicker of the baby's heartbeat. And the detection of this, we, we, we are, we, would not want to use CT because of radiation concerns, as we'll talk about in a little bit. But we also uh, cannot get this level of characterization as effectively with CT. Uh, this ability to detect this very tiny beating heart, CT is not capable of doing at this time. And it's because of the favorable environment. Uh, any woman here who's had a sonogram knows that the first thing you're going to get asked to do is drink lots of water. And the reason why you have to drink lots of water is, is that we want your bladder to fill up with urine so that we have a window. It creates a window for us to see into uh, the pelvis, to see the uterus, to see the ovaries, and to be able to see like this. We have two roots in. We have the, the root from the surface of the skin through the bladder, but we also have a transvaginal root where a probe is placed into the vagina and allows much closer positioning uh, of the transducer to these organs. And, and th those are uh, both important techniques. So who knows what this is? Triplets, exactly. <laughs> these are not my triplets. I do happen to be the father of triplets. But uh, the, here you can see three heartbeats. And so here's a nice example of triplets. And here, a little older, is a fetus. and the detailed examination of the heart. Remember the echocardiogram I showed you? This is within a fetus, and you can see the, uh, the four chambers, and you can see the valvular function. Sonography is critical, is the critical test for prenatal diagnosis of disease, and often uh, is very important in being able to manage risk and being able to do everything that can be done to assure uh, safe delivery and uh, optimal care for children who are born with some type of developmental defect. And then, of course, I, I had to show you something like this, too, right? <laughs> so this, this, is, uh, this is a normal fetus uh, sucking their thumb. And here you see the amniotic fluid allowing us to see this. Now, another application for sonography that is also very important is taking advantage of what is called the Doppler phenomenon. Now, the Doppler phenomenon is something that you're familiar with. You may not be familiar with it in name, but you experience it almost every day. If you stand on the street corner and a truck drives by honking their horn, you're going to hear that as it goes, as it comes toward you, the pitch of the horn is going to get higher, and then as it goes away, it's going to get lower. And that is just because of the, the acceleration of the sound waves relative to your uh, position. Uh, and we can use that information by taking our pulse and sending the sound into moving structures, that same frequency shift is going to occur and we can detect it. And so this is a blood vessel here, uh, which has some irregularity in it. And this is standard, what is called B-mode sonography, which shows no uh, signal through the homogeneous blood. But by taking advantage of the Doppler signal at the same time, we can map the velocity of the blood at every discrete point within the lumen of the blood vessel. And Doppler sonography is a very important adjunct. It's used extensively in echocardiography. It's used in many blood vessels within the body. Very common to look at the carotid arteries with Doppler sonography and the arteries of the leg. In fact, it's not just blood vessels. We use Doppler all the time when we're examining the urinary bladder in this case to confirm what are called ureteral jets. And that's just a demonstration of urine coming from the ureter. That ureter is the tube that goes from the kidney to the bladder. The urethra goes from the bladder to the outside world. And so if we want to be sure that there's no obstruction of the ureters, we just need to look for these jets, and we see them because of the Doppler signal. So to conclude in talking about sonography, the value of sonography is predominantly in several areas. It's in obstetrics and gynecology. It's also in pediatrics. I didn't show you a lot of pediatric sonography, but sonography is great for children for several reasons. One, because it doesn't involve ionizing radiation, which we're going to talk about in just a few moments. There's less risk to children whose 
tissues of their body are much more sensitive to radiation. So we like to avoid it whenever possible. But also, children are smaller, and so there's less distance for the sound to pass through. And in general, they have less of what makes ultrasound not work so well. They have less fat, and they have uh, uh, smaller collections uh, of gas and, and such that enable a sonography to be effectively used in ways that we can't use it in adults. We can look at the GI tract, for example, uh, in children routinely with sonography, whereas in adults it's very, very difficult. I talked about echocardiography, and then in adults also we use sonography very commonly to look at commonly fluid-filled structures, probably uh, the most common way that the gallbladder is looked at. And you know gallbladder uh, inflammation, cholecystitis as it's called, is an important uh, abdominal surgical emergency. It's very common. Uh, it's usually diagnosed with sonography. Looking at the urinary bladder because they're filled with fluid is also uh, a key application. So as I showed you initially, sonography is probably done about half to a third as much as CT scanning in our hospital, in modern hospitals. It's not quite as prevalent, but still very important in these specific areas. Maybe I can just take one question on sonography if there's one. Yes? Is there any risk at all to a fetus for, for having like multiple sonograms? So that's a good question. The question is, is there any risk to a fetus for having multiple sonograms? As I mentioned at the outset, all imaging involves energy. And there is energy being deposited with an ultrasound, and that energy is in the form of high-frequency sound waves. And you can model the effect of those sound waves on tissues and can demonstrate some disruption uh, in, uh, in static tissues. I'm not talking about a living person now. But uh, there, there's ways to make ultrasound appear as though it could do damage. Having said that, there has not been any demonstration or documentation of any uh, damage uh, that has occurred in vivo in life. And uh, we, to this date, are unaware of any consequences of multiple fetal ultrasounds. Now, um, it's probably important to understand that any a child who's going to have many ultrasounds during the course of their gestation are probably not healthy children. Uh, usually, um, for a healthy child, they're going to at max have two, maybe three ultrasounds. One at the time of detection of the pregnancy, one if they're from an older mother uh, at around 16 weeks to make sure everything's okay, and then maybe right before birth just to make sure that uh, the baby is in the right position and that the heart's beating well and, and to monitor the delivery. Uh, th through all that use of ultrasound, there's no data whatsoever to indicate that there's any lasting risk. There. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not so familiar with therapeutic use of ultrasound for tissue injury, but I would guess that we're talking about orders of magnitude difference in the amount of energy that's being deposited there. Just like we use x-rays to kill cells in cancer through the practice of radiation oncology, so too can very high intensity sound. Too much of anything, you know, will obviously have a different impact. And the, the amount of sound being used here is just enough to hear an echo coming back, not to disrupt the tissue. Okay, I'm gonna move on. I wanna be sure that we get to everything here without running out of time. I'm gonna talk about magnetic resonance imaging next. Uh, MRI is really a, a phenomenal modality. Uh, it's, it is without a doubt of any modality that I could talk to you about the most complex uh, and the richest in terms of the amount of information that it gives us and that the potential that it has for the future. In order to explain to you how MRI works, it, it is, it's a little bit of a challenge, but in general, we're imaging protons, uh, which of course are in the nucleus of the atom. And we can only image protons that are in nuclei that have an odd number of protons and neutrons. They act like small little magnets, uh, which are called dipoles. That's maybe a little bit MRI trivia for a lot of you, but that's sort of the requirement to be able to use MRI. Now, here's kind of how it works, okay? When you get all these dipoles in the body, if you can get them organized, they will sing back to you and tell you a lot about the body. So what do I mean by that? So first thing that we have to do with MRI is we gotta get all these dipoles which are pointing in all different directions to line up. And so we put people in a big magnetic field. And that magnetic field doesn't get all of them lining up, but gets a lot of them lining up in a single direction. 
And then we use uh, a radio frequency pulse, an electromagnetic pulse, to perturb, to, to knock those spins off their rocker a little bit. From, and, and then while they come back, they emit electromagnetic radiation back out to us. And we can hear it. We don't hear it as an audible signal, but we hear it with <coughs> detectors, with, with uh, detectors within the MRI system. And the frequency with which the information comes back, the temporal relationship with which it comes back, and the way we excite uh, the body with these radio frequency pulses tells us a tremendous amount about the environment of the tissues. It tells us uh, whether or not uh, Things are, whether structures are moving, it tells us what kind of molecular environment they're in. Uh, it's kind of the, sort of the analogy is, is that uh, if you have an auditorium here of all of you folks, and at the beginning you were all just conversing yourselves, and uh, you were all little spins, we wouldn't necessarily be able to make sense of, of any uh, unified conversation. But if if uh, somebody got in front of you and said, look, we're going to all sing happy birthday to so-and-so, and we all sang in unison, that is like the MRI experiment. Uh, it, the, that magnetic field is like someone saying, we're going to sing happy birthday now. And everybody sings it at a little different pitch and might sing it at a little different uh, delay. But it's that richness of, of the individual way, at least, that we're all on the same task that the MRI is allowing us to see uh, the behavior of the protons in the body. Ho hopefully that, uh, that helps give you a little intuition about it. This is an MRI scanner. It also involves a donut or a gantry, but nothing is spinning in there. Uh, this is a big magnet in here that the patient uh, goes inside of, and then there are coils inside. Uh, sometimes uh, we place the coils very close to a person. This is a knee coil. This is a head coil. These coils are the receiving coils. They're getting listening back. You know, the closer you are, the easier you can hear a quiet signal. And so that's how we listen back, and we're able, in this case, to map the brain, as you see here, in this case, the knee. Now, what do we get from doing all of this? Here is a CT scan of the spine. Here, remember, the calcium in the bone is dense, so the vertebral bodies look bright, the trachea has air in it, it looks dark, and here's the spine in here. And because the spine is all surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid and the spine itself is soft tissue, there's not a lot of uh, variation in electron density to help us see detail. But with MRI, we can use many different tissue mechanisms, many different mechanisms. This is just two of them, so-called T1 and T2 weighted imaging, uh, that allow us to see different characteristics. And here you see in particular, with T2 weighted imaging, water, free water is very bright. And you see how it forms almost a natural contrast agent as it outlines the spine and the structures of the brain. Notice that the degree to which these tissues are visualized with MRI is far greater than we see with the CT scan. Now, here's, here's a real world example. This is a person who came to the emergency room with a headache, and they had this CT scan. And you'll notice that there's an area here of what we call low attenuation. That means that there's a, a, a relative low propensity for these tissues to attenuate the x ray beam, so it passes through. But all we see is really this sort of dark gray area right here. Now, here is the MRI. And in the MRI, first off, we're much more sensitive to what is tissue edema within the white matter. But in particular, we see this little focal ring-enhancing structure, which is an infection in the brain. With the CT again, you really can't see it. Maybe right there it was there, but you just can't be so sure. MRI provides us with a plethora. Again, we could spend the, literally the entire quarter just talking about MRI and how it can be used to image the body. The CNS, very important for MRI. The musculoskeletal system, very important. Here's the wrist. Here's a projection radiograph. All those bones in there. Here is an MRI. The MRI, the bones are dark on T2 weighting. The fluid in the joint space is bright. The cartilage is bright. Here we're seeing direct visualization of the triangular fibrocartilage, which is a cartilaginous element that is readily injured. That you just have no way of seeing with an x-ray. Here's another, this is a T1-weighted uh, image here. It shows us uh, the cortical bone here is black. 
Uh, the, the medullary portions of the bone here are, are white because of fat in it. But again, you just see the tremendous detail. And here is a, a transverse section laying out the carpal tunnel. And here are the individual uh, nerves within the carpal tunnel and the tendons uh, traveling within the carpal tunnel are all directly visualized. This kind of delineation of soft tissue structures, all of these structures, tendons and nerves, have very similar electron density, but they're in very different molecular environments because of the nature of the tissue. And therefore, we can exploit our MRI tool to get different information so that they appear differently and so that we can discriminate those structures and diagnose abnormalities. Here is an x-ray of the knee. Here is an MRI of the knee. It's a stack of cross sections. And here we are looking at the meniscus. There, I, I won't call out all of the, the structures because I, I don't want it to get too jargony for you. But you can just hopefully appreciate that there is a much more of a richness in what can be seen. Uh, this is a stack of coronal views uh, through the knee here. And you can just see uh, many of the ligaments and the cartilage are directly visualized. I'll just show you an example of a very common knee injury. Uh, hopefully none of you have had this, but it is very common. This is an anterior cruciate ligament tear. Uh, the anterior cruciate ligament uh, passing right here is torn right at this point. The ligament is dark and it is disrupted here. Here you see on the T2 weighting, all of the fluid here is, is because of a reaction to the injury. There is what we call a joint effusion fluid in it and this disruption of the tendon. The, there are things, that are, are, sorry, of the ligament. There are so many structures in the musculoskeletal system around joints in particular uh, and in the CNS that we can really only effectively see with MRI. And it's, it's a very, very important tool. One other uh, use of MRI that you may be familiar with that I'll just mention in passing is MR angiography. There's many ways to highlight flowing blood and blood vessels in MRI. We do give contrast material, usually so-called, it's, it's gadolinium, and you'll notice gadolinium is all the way down here. It's not because it has a high electron density that's effective uh, in MRI. It's because it has the propensity, propensity to make adjacent protons sing very loud wherever it is. And uh, so uh, it has that effect, what is called a paramagnetic effect, uh, in order to brighten uh, structures. And when we inject it, we highlight the blood vessels. So it really is almost unfair to MRI to spend such a short period of time talking about it, but I'm trying to spend time in proportion to the prevalence of these tests. And so let me just indicate to you that, that MRI has some very important niches uh, in uh, the medical center right now. Without a doubt, the two most important organ systems are the central nervous system and the musculoskeletal system. They probably represent 90% of our MRI exams. And so I showed you both of those. I showed you an example of a brain infection. Uh, I showed you an example of uh, joint imaging uh, with MRI. And, and there, there's, there's, there is so much more. Uh, we do use it a fair bit in the heart. Not so commonly, but it, it really offers unique characterization of many tissues in the body. It's just that it tends to be relatively time consuming. It uh, is a relatively expensive modality, and so it is used in niche applications outside of these primary areas. But th there's a lot of exciting uh, applications, and one I'll just highlight briefly is that because of the measurement of flowing blood is possible, it has developed uh, the field of what is called functional MRI, which basically examines brain activation based upon changes in blood flow within the brain, very subtle very subtle degrees of blood flow variation. And by asking a person to look at something or think about something or, or to do a task and to measure the blood flow variation when they do that, this is creating all kinds of insights into the way the brain functions, uh, both in normal and in disease states. Just one example of how MRI is making a huge uh, uh, impact in science. The last modality I want to touch upon briefly is nuclear medicine. Nuclear medicine represents uh, only 3% of our imaging, but it is still uh, very, very important to be aware of. Uh, in nuclear medicine, we don't use anything uh, external to apply energy. We don't have a big magnetic field. We put the energy directly into the patient. We give a probe molecule into the body, and that probe molecule has a radionuclide, which is a radioactive element that's attached to the probe, and through radioactive decay, we get irradiation back out of the patient. And I can assure you the levels of radiation that are associated with this are very, very low. There is radiation exposure, but it's not out of um, 
consistency with the other techniques we've talked about. The probe tends to have a specificity for tissue that it results in it attaching to sites where the tissue might find it useful. So it might be a target for metabolism. It might bind to a receptor on the surface of uh, a uh, type of tissue where a certain protein tends to bind. And in fact, nuclear medicine is at the vanguard of the very exciting area of what's called molecular imaging, which is uh, the development of increasingly more specific and targeted imaging probes to, uh, to monitor cellular processes and, and uh, and uh, to be able to monitor the progress of cells themselves uh, through the body. But that's still sort of out in the future a little bit. Nuclear medicine can be done projectional or cross-sectional. The two types are with either gamma emission, which is called SPECT, that stands for single photon emission computed tomography, or positron emission, that's positron emission tomography. Uh, this is an example of a common nuclear medicine test. It's called a bone scan. A radioisotope is injected, uh, and in this case, uh, the projections are acquired after the injection. This bright spot here is where the injection occurred. So there's a lot of tracer that just happened to uh, extravasate into the tissues, and the rest of the tracer went into the bones. And it's useful in looking for uh, metastases in the bone, looking at disseminated um, bone disease. It very quickly screens the whole body. Uh, this is another example, this is just a white on black, uh, uh, or sorry, white, yeah, uh, no, black on white image. These are a couple of rib fractures, for example. Bone scans highlight anywhere where there's what's called osteoblastic activity, that's where newborn bone is forming. Here is an example of a patient with extensive prostate cancer. This is a radiograph. These are the distribution of the areas where the bone is trying to regenerate in the, in the sites where the prostate cancer has distributed into the bones. So th this is a common application for bone scanning. Um, PET scanners more and more are being combined with CT scanners uh, because whereas the PET scanner gives us a lot of information about tissue function, it doesn't really show us the anatomy well. The CT shows us the anatomy well. So here's a PET image with a really bright uh, object. This is a place that is a lot of concentration of tracer. Here's the CT scan and when you put it together, the lung cancer that we see here is taking up a lot of the tracer. And the tracer here is going to be fluorodeoxyglucose glucose, which is the primary uh, tracer that is used for PET. Glucose metabolism is very uh, important in cancer uh, metabolism, and so uh, cancer loves glucose, and so we use uh, the FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, it's the fluor F18 that is the positron emitter, and uh, that, that is attached to the glucose and enables us to see this. Uh, another example of PET scanning, this is a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you can see here the numerous, these are all lymph nodes throughout the body that are taking up the FDG, not because uh, of, of uh, that they're you know, denser than any other structure or because they're in a different molecular environment, but specifically because of their metabolism, because they are using up glucose at a much higher rate. So nuclear medicine basically uniquely demonstrates the function of tissue, its metabolism. It's also used to map flow of a tracer in the bloodstream uh, and uh, other uh, tracks through the body. Most commonly, though, we use it to assess cancer spread, and uh, it's also used extensively in assessing the heart. The very last thing I'm going to touch upon here is safety of imaging. I told you I would do this. And I can't cover all of these modalities and all the potential risks. X-ray or ionizing radiation, uh, we want to talk about iodine, which is given as a contrast agent, does have some risk to some people who have renal dysfunction or who have allergies. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to that, and we're not going to really be able to talk about uh, potential risks of electromagnetic radiation with MRI. People hearken to uh, cell phones and concerns about cell phones, but uh, the amount of electromagnetic radiation that comes from a cell phone is much higher than what is experienced from an MRI exam, just to put things in perspective. G gadolinium also is an agent that has been in the news a bit as having risks, uh, which I'd be happy to address afterwards. But let's just have a few brief uh, comments on ionizing radiation. Why is it bad? Ionizing radiation will alt alters DNA, which causes mutations, which in turn can cause cancer, it can cause birth defects, and it cause, can cause tissue death by inhibiting cell regeneration. So for example, the, the tissues in the body that are constantly regenerating, like the mucosa of the gut, uh, are areas that are most susceptible, uh, and that is uh, only in extremely high doses, but this is acute radiation injury. Fortunately, uh, these types of uh, 
uh, phenomenon are almost impossible to do with diagnostic imaging uh, equipment. But, but nevertheless, our concerns about risks of radiation should be very real. You should understand that radiation sources are all around us. Within your lifetime, 82% will come from natural radiation, just from living on the planet Earth. 18% are man-made. 55% is terrestrial. It's because of radiation-producing elements that are in the soil, predominantly radon. There are also uh, internal elements within us. There's constant radioactive decay occurring within us, uh, and that provides us with 11% of our own radiation exposure. 11% currently comes from diagnostic imaging. It is certainly heterogeneously applied across the population. 8% comes from cosmic irradiation, and it's important to understand that this really increases with altitude. In fact, in Denver, you will have five times more radiation from cosmic rays than you will at sea level. And so people who live at altitude have a much higher radiation exposure. Traveling across the country in an airplane also gives you a substantially, uh, substantial amount of radiation exposure simply by virtue of the fact that you are uh, much higher up and uh, do the cosmic radiation. And in fact, there are other sources like consumer products. So here's kind of how it, how it lays out very briefly in terms of putting it into perspective. A chest x-ray, having a chest x-ray is about as much radiation as flying uh, a transcontinental. Uh, and in terms of the risk of death, and now you have to understand that these risks are based upon one database only, and that is as atomic bomb survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II. And, and obviously, uh, we don't have the time to talk about why that's a very challenging model uh, and why it's very different from medical imaging, but that's the best we have. We estimate um, one one-hundredth out of 10,000, which is basically one out of a million people who get a chest x-ray would potentially have a cancer from that chest x-ray. With CT, there's more radiation dose. That's about 150 plane flights, and that is about one and a half deaths per 10,000 people. So imagine yourself in a room of 10,000 people who've had a CT scan, one and a half of those people, or if you've got 20,000 people, let's say there's three people, let's do this simply, are, are, going to have, are, are going to die of cancer. PET scanning is on a similar scale. And just to put it in perspective again, the lifetime background of radiation you get from living on the planet Earth basically is equivalent to taking 10,500 plane flights. And this is kind of a little bit of a meaningless statistic uh, in that, you know, obviously we, we all die of something, right? But uh, it does put it in perspective on a relative basis. Having said that, there's no question that the rise of the use of uh, medical radiation should be an appropriate cause for concern. And the basic safety principle that we always carry in imaging is what we call ALARA, which means we use as low as reasonably acceptable to get a diagnostic study. This is applied uh, on every test that we do. And moreover, uh, I think that what we're seeing is an attention uh, by industry to develop technologies to further reduce the burden of radiation. We don't know for sure. Nobody has ever been shown to have a cancer caused by radiation exposure uh, through medical diagnostic imaging. But it's inferred, and it's a very real concern for us. And to be responsible physicians, we have to treat radiation responsibly. So let me just summarize very quickly by indicating that imaging provides critical diagnostic information in virtually all aspects of medical care. It is extremely rare that a person stays in Stanford Hospital and does not have an imaging test of some kind. New methods and modalities for imaging are being developed all the time and promise to offer important new insights into human health and disease, and I would be remiss if I didn't recognize some of my colleagues who loaned me uh, some material for this talk. And with that, I want to thank you all very kindly for your attention. Well, I, I would say, uh, Jeff, we gave you an impossible task. You more than exceeded it. And the applause, if this were MR, would be singing happy birthday for the next 100 years. Um, I think we are over time, so I'm not going to keep you all. I do want to thank Jeff for an absolutely spectacular presentation. Thank you all for being here. And come back next week. The last thing I'll say as you're getting up to go is we covered a huge amount, Dr. Rubin did tonight. 
Medicine is like taking a parachute into a foreign land. And for those of you who are just starting, uh, you're parachuted into a new world. And I promise you, by the end of the quarter, some of the things you heard are going to have a huge amount more relevance some than uh, even tonight. So thanks for being here, and thank you, Jeff. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.